Stabler fractures. This lecture is a review for Stabler fractures, and these are some of the important topics in Stabler fractures. So let's take the scenario of fractured dislocation of the hip. You reduce the hip within six hours. You need to evaluate the hip stability. If the fragment is large, you know that we need open reduction internal fixation. The problem is when the fragment is small, so you need to evaluate the hip stability. Usually, you see the posterior wall fracture in the obturator view, but sometimes you can't see it in the x-rays, and CT scan will be helpful. How do you evaluate the hip stability? Under anesthesia, you get dynamic fluoroscopic stress examination under anesthesia in the obturator oblique view and see if the hip is trying to subluxe or not. Check the medial clear space opening. After reduction of the hip, you will need to get CT scan to see if you have loose fragments, if you have posterior wall that you could not see on the x-ray. Usually, you see the posterior wall fracture in the obturator view. Radiology. In radiology, you want to recognize the lines that we draw on the pelvis. And what does it mean? We also want to recognize the fracture type on the CT because that will decide which approach you're going to use. The corner stone of understanding a stellar fracture is two lines you see on an X-ray. The iliopectineal line, which represent the anterior column, and the iliocial line, which represent the posterior column. If there is a fractal line crossing the stablum involving these two lines, then you have a transverse fracture. You can see the fracture involving both columns. You can see here the fracture involving the iliopectineal line and the iliocial line then that is a transverse fracture. And this is how the transverse fracture looks on an x-ray. You want to know the obturator view will give you the anterior column and the posterior wall, but also will show you the spare sign. You want to know that the iliac oblique view will give you the posterior column and the anterior wall. So let's take examples. This is the posterior wall and it will show in the obturator view. And when you stress it in the obturator view, the head will come out, will sublux in that view. This is the dynamic stress views. This is how posterior wall fracture appears in the CT. And here is a posterior column fracture. If we trace the iliopectineal line, it looks intact. That means the anterior column is intact. And if we trace the iliocial line, it looks interrupted. That means the posterior column is fractured. Medial displacement of the femoral head may look like a stabular protrusion. You cannot see the fracture in the obturator view, but you see the fracture in the iliac view. And here you can see a CT scan showing the location and the direction of the posterior column fracture. So if you see that, you're going to go posterior approach. How do you see the associated both columns on the x-ray? When there is a segment of articular surface detached from the intact posterior ilium, that will be defined as associated both column fracture. The associated both column fracture will also give us the spare sign. The spare sign will be seen in the obturator view. The intact portion of the ilium is still attached to the axial skeleton and seen posterior superiorly to the medially displaced astablum. In associated both column fractures, the stablum portion is disconnected from the axial skeleton. 
floating establum, and there's an intact part of the ilium is still attached to the axial skeleton through the SI joint and sacrum, and you can see it posterior superiorly, and you can see the establum going medially, and that creates the spare sign. You need to cognize both column fractures in the X-ray and CT in associated both column fracture. The anterior column and the posterior column are involved. In addition to that, there is a fracture that extend into the iliac bone. The fracture will appear coronal on the CT and it will involve the ilium. When you have fractures of both columns, that can be a transverse fracture, a T fracture, or associated both column fracture. And you got to know the difference between the three entities. The transverse will involve the anterior column in the operator view and the posterior column in the iliac view, but will not extend to the ilium or to the operator framing. Transverse fracture is sagittal in orientation in the CT. Here's fracture of both columns, transverse. If it goes to the ilium, it becomes an associated both column fracture. If it goes to the operator framing, it becomes a T fracture. So you will be able to recognize these three fractures the associated both column, the transverse, and the T, both on the X-rays and CT scans. You'll be able to see the spare sign and say that's an associated both column fracture. I need to go anteriorly. If you see the floating establum that is detached from the intact portion of the ilium, then you say the establum is disconnected from the axial skeleton. This is associated both column fracture. I got to go ilioinguinal. So this is how the CT scan will show. This is the transverse. This is a column coronal. Coronal is C. Column is C. When it goes to the ilium, it is associated both column. When it goes to the operator framing, we'll get the inner wall of the establum. That becomes T. This is how you see the posterior wall. This is how you see the marginal impaction. There are 10 types of establar fractures. Five elementary and five associated fracture patterns. The simple fractures are posterior wall fracture, posterior column fracture, anterior wall fracture, anterior column fracture, and transverse fracture of the establum. The associated fracture patterns are Posterior wall and column fracture. Posterior wall and transverse fracture. T-shaped fracture. Anterior column and posterior hemi-transverse fracture. And associated both column fracture. This is a summary of all types of establar fractures, the elementary and the associated complex fractures. How about the static nerve injury? It occurs in about 10% of the injuries. Always check before surgery. And when you do the posterior approach, you will protect the static nerve by positioning the knee in flexion and the hip in extension during traction. By positioning the knee in flexion and the hip in extension during traction, that will decrease the tension on the sciatic nerve. You check for sciatic nerve injury before surgery and immediately after surgery. Always check for numbness at the top of the foot and weakness of dorsiflexion of the foot.
aortic tear and hip dislocation. Posterior hip dislocation can be associated with deceleration injury and in these cases may be associated with traumatic rupture of the thoracic aorta. In the chest x-ray, you will have mediastinal widening and in these cases you may need to do CT and geography. Approaches. The ilioinguinal approach is an anterior approach. will deal with anterior injuries like anterior wall, anterior column, associated both column fractures. The cocker back is a posterior approach. will deal with the posterior injuries such as posterior wall and posterior column. In general, and other types of fractures, the approach will depend on the displacement of the fracture. Is it displaced anteriorly? You go anteriorly. Posteriorly, you go posteriorly. Really, you need two approaches, anteriorly and posteriorly. But if you have a posterior wall fracture, that's big. You need to go posteriorly. Myositis occurs more with posterior approaches and when you do trochanteric osteotomy or extensile iliofemoral approach and also it occurs more in head injured patients. It occurs less with ilioinguinal approach. The best treatment is postoperative radiation within 72 hours or maybe preoperative radiation. The corona mortis. They call it the corona mortis because during an approach to the establum, there is a vascular variant that joins the external iliac and obturator vessels, crossing the superior pubic rami. If it is cut or lacerated, the vessel will retract and will cause hemorrhage that will be difficult to control. The cadaveric specimen showed that this anastomosis occurs in about 84% of the specimens and about 34% are arterial. The majority are venous. On the average, it's about 6 cm from the symphysis pubis. This corona mortis can be injured when you dissect over the superior pubic ramus while you plate the pelvic fractures, especially when you use the ilioinguinal approach. A stabler fracture in the elderly, it can be a low energy fracture. You may get the anterior column and the medial wall. If the fracture is not reconstructable, you may want to do some reconstruction in addition to total hip in the same setting. Some suggest associated both column fracture could be treated conservatively by traction in the elderly because some of the fractured fragments are free and loose. Then the head can mold the fractures together and create what you call secondary congruity. It will mold the pieces, make it more congruous. And some claimed they get good result from that method of treatment in the elderly. Outcome in establer fracture fixation. What will increase the risk of unsatisfactory outcome in establer fracture? The age greater than 55 years old, if we did not reduce the hip, within six hours. If you have a femoral head articular injury, femoral head fracture, or fracture dislocation. And the increased time between injury and surgery, that will decrease the chance of anatomic fracture reduction. Anatomic reduction can be done within 15 days for the simple fractures or within five days for the associated fractures. Timing of surgery, more than three weeks.
there will be failure of obtaining an atomic reduction and a good result. It will negatively affect the outcome in displaced stabler fractures. Marginal impaction is usually associated with posterior wall fracture. If it is significant, it can compromise the result of surgery if the lesion is missed or if the joint surface is not restored adequately. Toe touch weight bearing, which is about 10 to 15 kilogram, minimize the joint reaction forces across the hip. And this is what we use after open reduction, internal fixation of transverse and posterior wall fractures. Non-weight bearing will increase the contact pressure and the joint reaction forces. And this restriction of the weight bearing is better than non-weight bearing after stabler fractures. In non-weight bearing, there will be increased compressive forces across the hip due to activations of the muscles across the hip. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.